In this episode, I speak to Alan Hunkins, who is the author of Cracking the Leadership Code, Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. This podcast was originally recorded in June of 2020. We have a fascinating and interesting conversation on leadership and how to do it well. Alan explains that the three secrets to strong leaders are connection, communication and collaboration. Only 23% of people think their leaders lead well, and leadership is a relationship that people choose to follow their leaders. We need to learn that what we do or don't do as leaders really matter. One of the biggest leadership issues today is that 21st century leaders are trying to lead others with the leadership mentality born out of the industrial age. Listen up to the rest of this conversation. begin our conversation, here is a quick shout out to the pathologically curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke Maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast, on iTunes, Stitcher, or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today, our guest is Alan Hunkins. Hi, Alan. Hey, Jude. It's so great to be with you. I'm so excited for our conversation. So am I. I can just tell you're going to tell me lots of riveting information. (laughs) (laughs) So before you do that, tell us about you. Who are you? Sure. Who am I? What a deep question to get things started with. A uh, lot of things. So, you know, if I had to think of what I do is I help people become better leaders. That's, that's what I do. That's what I've been doing for 25 years now. And I've always been fascinated by people, what makes them tick. Mm-hmm. And I got started actually with that as a child. I think a lot of it has to do with my fairly unusual childhood. So I was raised by a single mom and my grandma. Now that's mm-hmm. not unusual. Lots of people <laughs> have that experience. <laughs> that's not unusual. But both, so my mom and my grandmother, they're both Holocaust survivors. So my mom's an mm-hmm. immigrant from Belgium. And from the time she was seven until she was 10, she was in hiding. She was separated from her mom and through the Belgian underground during World War II. And they were luckily reunited after the war, but the rest of the family, most of the rest of the family was killed. And that, as you can imagine, really changed their worldview and living through that traumatic experience and obviously shaped the way they raised me. And I think, you know, I grew up in New York City. I went to public school. So, you know, there's an old child song we used to sing was one of these things is not like the other, right? That's (laughs) Sesame Street. I remember watching that on Sesame Street. Yeah, you remember that one? Yeah, (laughs) yes. Sesame Street and I are about the same age. I think it started when I was two. Anyway, (laughs) All of which to say is my experience at home was so different. It was not like the other outside of, you know, with friends at school. Yeah. And, I, and I think part of my interest in human behavior and human psychology and why we do the, what we do is based on the fact that I was trying to reconcile the family I came from. And so I've really wanted to help people unlock the mindsets and the skill sets to be able to, I think we're, we're so capable of so many amazing things as human beings. And so obviously I'm framing that now in an organizational and leadership context, but really it's personal as well. Cause I believe inside each of us, there's this brilliance that is wanting to be unleashed. And what we need is we need structures and tools and support to help us to do that. So that's what I'm all about, really. I mean, and I've been doing that in numerous capacities in lots of ways over the years. And having had the gift of working with literally 2,000 groups over 20 years, I started taking notes. And the notes turned into blog posts. And the blog posts turned into chapters of what is now this book called Cracking the Leadership Code, The Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. And it's my way of sharing what I've learned from real life leaders, not just the great ones, but also the lousy ones. Because the fact is, success and mediocrity both leave clues. And so I wanted to be able to help people to shorten the learning curve 
and to accelerate their ability to be better leaders. Now that sounds interesting. What are the three secrets? Now you I would tease you. Us. You can't tease us like that and then not. Tease oh, us. but here, there are secrets. You know, if I tell you, then I'll have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> like to no. see you try. <laughs> I'd like to try. No, that's the old joke, right? I tell you, but I can't. Um, yeah. So here are the three secrets. The three secrets of building strong leaders are connection, mm-hmm. communication, and collaboration. Now, it's funny because some people say, that doesn't sound very secret. That sounds kind of like common sense to me. And <laughs> quite, quite, quite frankly, Jude, that's totally common sense. That being said, I did a bunch of research into this. And it turns out that worldwide, only about 23% of people think their leaders lead well, which leaves a huge room for improvement. And it also tells me, while connection, communication, and collaboration sound like common sense, there's certainly not become common practice. So again, I've wanted to figure out what is it those 23% are doing well and what, the, what can they teach the rest of us so that we can get better? Well, I actually think 23% is quite high. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It could be. Which is quite tragic. So what, what I'm curious then is how these three things break down. So what do you... So what do you say makeup connection sure so yeah to me they're all interrelated but it starts mm-hmm. with connection because from my take and my experience is that leadership isn't about a job title it isn't about control or power it isn't about uh whether or not you have a fancy title at the end of your business card leadership at its core is a relationship and the mm-hmm. quality of that relationship is based on the quality of the connection between the person who leads and the person who chooses to follow. And I use that word chooses very intentionally because to me, we choose every day when we show up to be a follower, whether or not we're going to give our all, give our engagement, give our best ideas. You know, we, we choose to hold that back or we choose to give it. And so I think, again, people understand, okay, great. So I got to create connection. Where do I start? Well, the place to start with that is with empathy. The fact is people who feel cared for by their immediate supervisors outperform people who don't on a whole host of series of metrics and are more likely to stay in their roles. It's the number one factor is feeling cared for. And my definition of empathy, by the way, is showing people that you understand them and care how they feel, which again, as we hear, that sounds like a very basic human thing to do. And for the most part, it is for most of us in certain places, like with our loved ones, our family, and our friends, really empathetic, put us into work situations where there's power, there's rank, there's control, there's money maybe involved, and suddenly things shift. So there was a great study in 2019 that found that while 92% of CEOs say that their organizations are empathetic, only 50% of the employees in those organizations say that their CEOs are empathetic. So again, here's a huge gap. And so to me, I was looking at these patterns. So why is empathy, leading with empathy specifically, harder than it looks? And I write about six different challenges in the book. I want to share two of the biggest challenges to leading with empathy. The first one I think we can all relate to is patience. Fact is, showing people that you understand them and care how they feel isn't some item you can just check off of a to-do list. You know, while we might be able to cruise through our emails at the speed of light with information technology, human relationships actually take more time. And so showing empathy means showing patience. And as you know, Jude, today in our world, patience is in such short supply. You know, we've all got plates that are overflowing. We've all got these results to deliver. The problem is we can't drive for results at the expense of the people who are trying to deliver those results. So that's one of the big challenges to leading with empathy is impatience. The other one, frankly, is fear. There's a lot of people who still are very uncomfortable with emotions in the workplace. I'll tell you a story about this guy, Bob. He's a managing director for a consulting firm. And he was really honest. I appreciated the honesty because he said to me, yeah, you know, I don't ask the people on my team how they feel. Absolutely not. And you want to know why? Because if I ask them, you know what might happen? They might tell me. (laughs) I don't think I want all that information. Right. So Bob comes from that school of this is work. We check our feelings at the door, right? That check your feelings at the door policy, which is a really weird thing when you stop and think about it. Because... You can't really check your feelings at the door. Now, what we can do and what many people do do 
is suppress their feelings at the door. In fact, Deloitte did this great study that found that 61% of employees cover their identities in some way. That is, they wear a mask because they don't feel safe to be able to bring their whole self to work. And let's face it, when we put on that mask, and we've all been there at some point probably, but when you wear that mask, you can't but help be disconnected. And this perpetuates a low empathy, a low empathy, low connection, low performance culture. So that's, I'd say, the start of how do you get into connecting? You start by learning to be more empathetic. Okay, that's really good. Thank you for that. It made me think of a few things because I think that there's this, disconnects isn't it when people talk about empathy so I've met leaders who tell me that they're a real people person and you know they care about people and what they do and how they feel and all this sort of stuff and I say yeah I hear what you're saying and I believe that's right in a cognitive way but from what I've observed you only seem to care about the person when you need something or they can give you something and that's not being a people person and then when they said, what do you mean? I said, well, you only ever ask somebody how they're feeling if when your next question is, have you finished that report? Exactly. Or, or the report's late. So you say, is there anything happening at home? You know, it's, it's, so I said, you don't, it's not like you're horrible and you don't care about people. It's just not your priority. Your priority is, is that you said that, you know, about the emotions at home. You're not really that interested on how that person is feeling or what's happening in their world only until it impinges on yours. And I, and I, you know, and for me, that's a, one of the key differences with maverick leaders who are interested in people regardless of the context. Um, they don't need something from that person to care how they are feeling. They just care. And the way that the world is going now, especially um, amplified by COVID-19, is that, People do not want to work for organisations. They don't care about them because they can just leave and work somewhere else where they do. Exactly. You bring up such a great point about that. Because the fact is, in this day and age, with such transparency, with you know te- technology like LinkedIn and Glassdoor, people know where the grass is greener. And if I'm going to have a mediocre environment where people don't care about me, I'll trade in this mediocre environment for another one for potentially 10 or 15% more salary or whatever it might be. And so again, if you don't care about retaining and engaging great people, don't bother being a good leader. But if those metrics matter to you, that's the point. I mean, you're not going to attract and retain great people unless you find ways in that they feel connected, communicated, and collaborated with. Because that is, the, that is what I call the 21st century leader's challenge. And it is very different from what it was like leading 50 or 70 years ago. The world was very different. And today, we live in a world of options. Let's face it. Amazon has spoiled us that we want everything in the world to be one click. Whether or not it's Amazon or not, we have these expectations. And we have them as consumers. We also have them as employees. And so that means that we need to create for employees an engaging employee experience where people feel, oh my gosh, there's nowhere I'd rather be. Because if exactly. we don't offer that to them, they're going to go find somewhere else to go. I've um, I had the honour and the pleasure of um, doing a podcast with Harris Rosen. Um, I don't know. He, he's the hotelier um, in Orlando, and he he's um, adopted. So he's a very successful hotelier, and he's adopted a couple of underserved communities, and he. Helped, has helped rebuild them financially in terms of um, you know, millions and millions of dollars, but also he, you know, hands dirty getting all the stuff. He's an amazing guy, and he was talking and it, he's talking about his employees and how long they've worked for him. So one of the things that he does is that if you if you work for him for three years, then he'll pay you through college or any other further degree that you need, or your children. And he does. He has his own primary health care person, so you don't have to pay for medicines and all this kind of stuff. And when you look at um, the employees and, and when they've been interviewed and they talk about him, they cry because you know because they're like he's just so wonderful, and they would never consider leaving because they could never imagine being anywhere else. And, wow. You know, and he's one person who's genuinely caring about the people, not just the people. Not just them when they're at work, but their home situations. 
enough for them to decide to pay so they don't have to pay for any preschool costs any high school costs any university costs because he, he doesn't want them to have to worry about that and that says something when you compare it to another hotelier who's paying minimum wage and all the rest of it it's a it's a big difference and i've noticed if i do leadership training and i say you know leaders have to care about their, their employees and there was there's always a large proportion of people who are surprised that that's important and it's not as if we're you know, it's not the industrial revolution where everybody's just a piece of machinery. You know, if you're working, if you're working with knowledge workers or really specialised technicians, then you can't treat them like an extension of the factory floor, can you? No, not at all. Exactly. I mean, that's an amazingly inspiring story you told about this hotelier. Yeah, it's interesting. In, in, the, in the book, I actually go deep into the history of the industrial age and how much that mindset mm. has informed where we are today. So, you know, you think about why do we have so many leaders struggling? I think part of it has to do, as you've said, with the fact that you've got a lot of 21st century leaders who are still clinging to this mm. industrial age 20th century mindset. And so I, I was going, I went, where did this come from? And I did my research and I went back and back and back and I found the person who's considered the father of the field of organizational management is Frederick Winslow Taylor, yeah. who was by training a mechanical engineer. So his worldview was the factory, which was the workplace, the workplace was a mechanical engineering problem to be solved. So that's where we made that shift, where suddenly human beings became human resources. In fact, his 1911 book, which is called The Principles of Scientific Management, if you read some of the sections out of it, it will literally make your head spin or your jaw drop or both. So for example, one thing that Taylor writes about, he describes the ideal worker. And I'll quote this because I could not make this up if I tried. He said, the ideal worker would be, quote, so stupid that he more nearly resembles in his mental makeup the ox than any other type, end quote. I mean, this is, the, the, that's the mindset, right? It's basically Taylor's you again. are, you're an ox, you know, come in. You know, in fact, one of his biggest disciples was Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. who founded the Ford Motor Company. And Ford famously said of his Ford employees, he said, why is it every time I want a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached? Right? So you hear things like that and you think, realize because that was the mindset. You were a cog in the industrial machine. So maybe not surprisingly, Taylor's ideas spread like wildfire at the time. In fact, his work became the basis of the curriculum of a little startup educational institution you might have heard of. It's called Harvard Business School. In <laughs> fact, in fact, um, his book, Principles of Scientific Management, was voted as the most influential management book of the 20th century. So you look at that and you think that is the legacy that all of us who work in a leadership role have inherited to a greater or lesser extent. And if we don't stop and question and go, wait a minute, that might have worked in the widget factory, but I'm not working in a widget factory with people who are making widgets. I, like you said, I'm working with knowledge workers, specialized people, and what I need to do to get the best out of them is to create the environment where I'm putting the best into them so they can thrive. Yeah, it's kind of, it is ironic, and you can see why Mavericks have struggled through the years to survive in, you know, in corporate companies, because they're like, why well, you have authority over me for now, because that seems to work. But the minute you start talking foolishness, I'm taking that authority back and doing my own thing. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's such a good point, Jude, because I mean, it's so interesting. You know, I do a lot of work with creativity and innovation. And, you know, every large organization says, oh, we want our people to be in innovative. It's like, yeah. really, really do you? Because I find for the most part, people who are high on the adapter innovator scale towards creativity and innovation, they don't want to follow rules. They actually right. tend not to do well in large organizations. Because like you said, they're mavericks. They don't want to play. There's so much command and control compliance and procedures that are in place that stifle and, and they, feel, they feel suffocating in those environments. They feel suffocated. That sounds good. So we have um, connection and empathy and patience. And what about communication? All right. Well, the biggest challenge with communication is the fact is, you, you ever been to a carnival where they have those little ring toss games where you have to throw a ring on top of a bottle? You've seen those at a you carnival? Know, ever? Games. Yeah, I've seen those. yeah, they're rigged. I know they're very hard. <laughs> to win. Right? All of which to say, if we use that analogy for a moment, if you yeah. imagine that there are three rings in communication and there's the ring of what do you mean? 
there's the ring of what do you say, and then there's the ring of what do I hear. For there to be actual, complete understanding, all those three things have to line up. So what you say is what you mean, is what I hear. And that happens about as often as an extremely rare solar eclipse. Very, very uncommon. And so the biggest thing leaders need to understand is that the default setting for communication is misunderstanding. And what we have to work is using all of our skills to make sure that when we are in information transfer with other people is we're seeking to have shared understanding. And the reason that is so important is because shared understanding becomes the platform for all future action. If we have great understanding, we can then make great decisions to create great results. If we have lousy understanding, we're gonna make lousy decisions, we're gonna get lousy results. And so one of the biggest challenges that leaders face is what psychologists call the projection bias. And I'll tell you a story that'll bring this to life. This is not a work-related story, but it'll, it'll take us into work. So um, I live in Massachusetts most of the time with my wife, Mary, and we have some old friends we've known for a long time named Pam and Charlie, who drove to visit us from Washington, D.C. Now, our house has a very narrow driveway that widens out at the end so we can park our two cars side to side. So when Pam and Charlie came to visit us, they parked their car behind our two cars, which basically blocks us in, which really is not a big deal until I had to leave to go to the airport, at which time I asked Pam if she could please move her car and park out in front of the house. And she said, you want me to park where? And I said, just go ahead and park your car out in front of the house. She said, you're sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. Please go ahead and park your car in front of the house. Okay, so she, she goes and moves her car. Now, I don't think anything else of it. I get in my car, I put my suitcase in the trunk, and I start to slowly back out the driveway, checking my mirrors carefully. And then all of a sudden, in the mirror, the weirdest thing catches my eye. It's Pam's car. <laughs> and she's, she's parked her car in front of the house, as in directly in front of the house, as in on the flower beds in front of the house that are now being crushed by the wheels of her car. Now, in my mind, I thought I could not be clear. When I say park your car in front of the house, what I mean is park your car on the curb, on the street in front of the house. I don't mean directly in front of the house. And that's when I realized that Pam had taken my words literally. And that's what the psychologists would call the projection bias, where we assume other people know exactly what we mean because we do. You see this at work all the time. I'm sure you've heard people say things like, well, I sent them the email. They should know what to do. Or doesn't senior leadership realize what a stupid process this is? In fact, anytime you hear someone say something like, well, don't they understand? Or why can't they realize? Or don't they see? That's the projection bias that has reared its ugly head. So this is one of the big challenges that we face. The fact is the default setting, you know, here's another way to think about it. How many of us have been in a meeting, a business meeting, and the meeting ends, and then after the meeting, we go out into the hallway and we have what I'll call the meeting after the meeting. Now, what did we just say to? What did you say? Who is doing what? Because we didn't deal with it in the meeting, right? So that's all those water cooler meetings afterwards or whatever those might be, meetings after the meetings, that is an example of communication gone awry. So do I'm gonna offer it. Do you think it's also though a part of the reluctance by so many leaders to actually actually execute? So they'd rather talk about what needs to be done, but don't end that meeting with right, who's doing what by when? Um, do you think yeah. it's also an execution? I mean, I mean, Part of it is, I think there's also a lack of courageous integrity to say, mm -hmm. hey, have we, have we decided anything? Because we can feel really important by filling our calendars with meeting after meeting where we discuss stuff. But there's a big difference between discussing and deciding, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what, is it, what have we come to as terms of decision point? Who's doing what by when? What's that going to look like? What are we committing to? You know, it's amazing how many organizations have defaulted to, and you may have seen this too, have defaulted to what I call bogus consensus. Like, oh, no, we can't decide because not everyone's here. We have to get everybody here together. Like, we all be agree. <laughs> now, look, consensus is good for some things, but if we have to make every decision with everybody, we're going to get very little done. Yeah, and definitely. so as leaders, we have to know, again, it's this wisdom. When do you go fast? When do you go slow? The fact is, 
we don't all need to decide what the appetizers for the holiday party are going to be. Okay. Just tell me it's going to be shrimp cocktail and I'll survive. Like you don't have to include me. It's okay. (laughs) So, but the thing is, so one of the things that I think really great leaders do is they clarify and confirm. I call this technique asking for a receipt. So if you think about why do we have receipts, right? So receipts are proof of a complete transaction. And in general, in life, the more important or valuable the transaction, the more likely you'd ask for a receipt. So you might buy a candy bar at the local shop and not get the receipt, but I bet you would never dream of buying a car or a house without getting one. Mm -hmm. So in communication, asking for a receipt is a way to make sure that your information has not just been confirmed, but it's also been understood. In fact, there's a great example that, about this that comes from the fast food industry. So this is dating us a little bit, but back in the 1980s is when all the fast food franchises started introducing drive throughs What they had the intercom, you could order and then drive through and pick up. And for the first couple of years, this whole ordering process with the drive through was a nightmare. It was really common that people would drive up to the intercom, place their order, and then they'd drive up to the window to pick it up, and the order would be filled with mistakes. And this went on for years. And then, all of a sudden, the drive through mistake rates just started to plummet. And you might think, what was the cool new technology? It was such a simple fix. The employees would start to repeat the order back to the customer before they'd start to make the food. What? You wanted two cheeseburgers, two fries, and two Coca-Colas? Is that right? Yes. Got it. Good. Boom. That's it, right? Just confirming understanding, asking for the receipt. And I like, like look, if they're going to spend do this for a, a hamburger that costs one pound 50, don't you think that the decisions that we make at work are worth the same level of clarity. So it's just how, how useful would it be is if, if as leaders, we book time in. So the last 10 minutes of the meeting, we said, okay, this is ask for receipt time. Let's go around and clarify and confirm what, who's doing what, what's that gonna look like? And are we all clear on what that means moving forward? Because again, how much duplication, how much rework, how many mistakes get made because we don't take the time to create that platform of shared understanding? That makes a lot of sense. When I used to work inside companies, when I was working with uh, senior teams and stuff, I used to say that if we've got the senior leadership meeting and this function and that function need to agree something, do all of that. Have your conversation before the meeting. You can see what's on the agenda. Meet up before and get it sorted. So when we're in the meeting, so one of you is telling us what's happening and then if we need a cent or something, we'll do it then. But we don't want to see the argument between the two of you in that meeting. It's a waste of our time to watch that, to get it sorted. <laughs> you know, so that the me- meetings are much more useful and much more productive because you are making real decisions rather than yeah. somebody hiding information so they can go, Da-da, look at me, I'm so wonderful, I've got this new bit of information. Yeah, Jude, what you're talking about there, it's such a great example of basically the unspoken power, ego, and control needs that need to get met by various people in leadership roles. An analogy I like to use regarding that you just described in organizations is the idea of a pendulum. So we're all familiar with the pendulum. If you can imagine you're holding it between your thumb and your forefinger on top, let's say it's a string with a weight on the bottom. Well, if you think of senior leaders as being kind of by up that thumb and forefinger, all they have to do is move a tiny little bit up on top. And then on the bottom of the pendulum, things are swinging back and forth wildly, right? And organizations are like that. So what you're saying here is, yeah, we don't want to see you guys swinging back and forth. You guys get yourself in alignment so you can have that stillness so we can follow what's going on. Otherwise, all you're doing is you're putting a lot of extra kinetic energy and motion and confusion into the system. And unfortunately, confusion is way more common than clarity. And there's a great study that was done by HR Magazine in the UK a couple of years ago. They found that 46% of employees report regularly receiving confusing or unclear instructions to the point where they waste an average of 40 minutes a day trying to decipher what those instructions mean. So that's the cost that you get when when you don't create clarity up front. That's one of the things that used to... I don't know, confound me with matrix management, you know, where you've got, you say you've got a member of staff, they're reporting to the line, but they've got indirect reporting into the function of its finance, HR, or whatever. And then something happens, and then there's a conflict in priorities between what the line wants and what the function wants. But this individual can't, they're not senior enough to categorically state which one they're going to follow. So they go to both managers and say, 
I've got an issue because him over there wants this and you over here wants this. Can you two sort that out? And nine at the time, they say, no, you need to. And it's like, what are you afraid of? You both get paid more than this person. You both have the authority and this person have, but you don't have the courage to meet your peer to say, I think this is, takes more priority than this, or let's discuss it. But you leave this other person stuck trying to, trying to get this resolved when they have no power to do so. And I've, I always thought that was, that shows such a lack of courage by those two senior managers. And it's just, that's the one thing that makes matrix management fail, when in reality, it could be a beautiful thing if, if it was worked properly. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I'm amazed. And you may have seen this too, is when I'll come and consult in organizations where there's the matrix structure. And oftentimes what I get is the sheepish shrug and the kind of half smile, like, it's a matrix. Sorry, it's a matrix. Like, and that's sort of the default to nothing around here functions well <laughs> because, sorry, it's a matrix. Like, that's how it is. And that's the, which is, like you said, if it isn't dealt with with courage and transparency, it's a good idea on paper, but it doesn't work in real life. And as you described, the person who gets stuck in the matrix between the rock and the hard place, it makes me think of the wonderful old quote from Edwards Deming, who said, you put a good person in a bad system and the bad system wins every yeah. time. Yeah. And that's what happens in those systems if they're bad. And then they leave and then you're stuck with the worst employee you can possibly have because they know they can't get a job anywhere else. So you, your organization ends up with a you know, we've learned yeah. of employees who are rubbish because all the exactly. good ones have gone. So that exactly. leads us neatly to collaboration. Yeah, so collaboration is a big topic. And if we think about collaboration, what it really means to me is this idea that for people to perform at their best, we as leaders need to create an environment that fosters their ability to perform at their best. And what I found in my work is that there were four fundamental human needs that need to be satisfied for people to perform at their best. The first need is the need for safety. Like we all have this need for safety and that exists on multiple levels. One is there's physical safety. For example, the reason that people are working from home and can't go into the office right now is because there's a pandemic. Therefore, we need physical safety. But beyond that, there's obviously there's psychological safety. So do people feel safe speaking up? We talked earlier about the need to be able to bring your whole self to work. So as a leader, a simple thing you can do, studies have found, is that psychologically safe teams, the team members have approximately equal amounts of airtime in meetings. That is that everyone is heard, everyone is listened to, and you don't just have a select few dominating the conversation. So something for me as a leader to watch out for is what am I doing to promote equal amounts of airtime? So safety is one of the primary fundamental human needs to collaborate well. Another one is energy. We all want to work in environments where we're energized. And there's a number of different things that people can do to create a more energized environment. One being, I'm sure we've all experienced this, when you have the meeting that goes on for two hours, two and a half hours, three, and you haven't taken a break and everyone's just about to lose their minds. So, for, so the simple fix for that is as a leader, plan for taking a break every 90 minutes or more often and build that into your agenda. Don't just say, oh, do we need a break when everyone is just about to pass out? Ooh. So there is, again, too many of us are operating from that old industrial mechanistic model. We'll just push on through. We have results to deliver. Let's try. No, actually the best thing you can do is take a break and then come back, be refreshed because you need people thinking. So that's just a simple example. The book goes through tons of examples of ways you can create a more energized work culture. The third need that we all have is the need for purpose. We want to feel that what, what we do matters. And so there are many things as leaders we can do to foster the sense of purpose. One being sharing the origin story of our organization. So why do we exist? Why do we matter? Who do we serve? Do we even bring, another thing we can do is we can bring in our customers that we serve and have them share the stories of how we've impacted them. So for example, one of my clients is a medical device company. And what they do is they have a quarterly town hall where they invite patients who use their products to come in and talk about how the quality of life of having used their medical devices has completely changed. And this, of course, for people who don't have a direct line of sight to the customer is completely inspiring because suddenly mm. it's, it's not that I'm just, you know, doing finance. I'm realizing, no, I'm doing finance for a company that is helping 
make people's lives a whole lot better. And in some cases, saving people's lives. Would that not inspire you to go to work better, more every day? No, it would for me. So that's the need for purpose. And then the fourth need that we have, so we've covered safety, we've covered energy and purpose. The fourth one is ownership that no one likes a micromanager who wants to tell you exactly how you need to do everything. Again, with knowledge workers, give them a very clearly defined what we're trying to achieve, but give them the freedom and the autonomy to figure out how they do it themselves. Now, that doesn't mean that you go and disappear, but create the framework, let them lead that process. Because when people lead their own process, they take ownership and they invest in it much more. So it's that need for ownership. So those are the four fundamental needs to create a collaborative environment. And leaders need to be able to nudge people by offering them tools to help meet the needs for safety, for energy, for ownership, and for purpose. That's fantastic. I can't disagree with any of that, um, <laughs> which, is always, which is always interesting. So the, what I think is interesting when you talked about that purpose and having a common purpose it made me think that it needs to be authentic because you would have seen it i'd imagine as much as i have where people say this is what we stand for this is what we believe in and then their very behaviors is conscious of that completely completely i mean it's so interesting because you know so often in organizations leaders go like oh this is what we stand for let's tell people this let's even in fact we stand for it so much let's frame that and put on a wall in our corporate lobby right our values our mission right we are a company of integrity we all you know enron that went bust after that massive fraud if you look at i can't remember them offhand but their company values were things like integrity customer service i mean all that they had said all the right things on paper but they weren't living it so if we want to know what an organization is like, take a look at the behavior of the leaders and not just what they say on the town hall day when they think they have to say the right thing. How do they show up every day? Albert Schweitzer, who won the Nobel Prize for two different categories, said this about example. He said, example is not the main thing in influencing others. It is the only thing. And so I think so such an important aspect of becoming a better leader is understand you have to become self-aware to know that you are being watched yeah. all the time because that comes with a territory. And yeah, you might be thinking, what well, I don't think about my people that much. Of course you don't because you've got a million other things to think about. But I bet you're thinking about your leader that way and they're not thinking about you. But this is the <laughs> nature of how organizations work. And so what that means is you have to embrace being in the spotlight and use it as a force for good. Again, today in this digital world, everybody is leaving a digital footprint. And so everything, every move you make, like, like Sting said, right? Every breath you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you, right? It's like we live in the surveillance world. And the fact is, so every tweet, every Facebook post, anything you think is offline is not offline. And so... What that means is as a leader, there is a tremendous responsibility and that means there's a tremendous opportunity because we have the ability to leverage our behavior to move people, to move them in the direction of some kind of shared purpose, shared goal, because people want to be part of that. I mean, look yeah. at the different movements. I mean, I love, like, look at what's going on in the United States right now around racial equality and how many people are showing up all over of all different nationalities and colors are showing up to support Black Lives Matter because this is a movement who people know they want to be on the right side of history. And so people want to contribute to things. I mean, look at the, how Wikipedia started. I mean, look at what it did to the traditional encyclopedia, right? Because mm. people said, I want to be part of contributing to the knowledge, greater knowledge. And people were volunteering their time to make that happen. So if we can tap into the desire that people have to contribute, we are in so much better shape than we would be otherwise. Yeah, I, I agree. It's all that kind of working for the greater good um, yeah. that socialised mavericks are, are really into. And what was interesting when you said about, you know, um, your employees are watching you, but you might not be watching them. And I would counter that and say good leaders should know, should be have the, the emotional awareness of their team, should be aware of it. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that for sure. 
Yeah. A lot of leaders forget that. And what the really good ones do is they are aware and and they're always checking in, right? They're checking in with the impact and asking for feedback. What could I be doing to support you better? Is there anything Mm -hmm. I could be doing differently that would make things better? That takes a certain level of, we'll call it, you could say courage, you could call it humility. The word I like, it's it's maturity, right? It's Mm -hmm. realizing this isn't about my ego. This is about me serving the greater good. If I'm in this leadership role, what can I be doing to serve you and the organization better? Because if you, as my direct report, thrive, I thrive and the organization thrives. So that's my job is to help you thrive. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's surprising that people don't really think about that ripple effect that you have from, you know, everybody that you interact, you're changing what they may or may not do based on your interaction. And then then when they have, they react, it changes somebody else's interaction. So, you know, you go around in a bad mood and shouting at people, then they will take on that, that on board and part it down. And eventually it'll hit the customer, won't it, at some point. Of you know. course. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we like to say, you know, I like to say is that emotions are contagious and emotions of the leaders are the most contagious. And we have to be really mindful of, because basically anything that we do sets the tone. Anything that we don't do sets the tone. You know, I was working with a group of flight attendants and one told me this story about how she was traveling from Frankfurt to Chicago and she was working the first class cabin of the flight. And this is not business class, this is first class. So these are the top, top, top tier customers who are paying easily 10,000 pounds or more for a ticket. Hmm. And if they're paying full fare. So she mentioned that one of the high up executives from the airline was flying on her flight and he was sitting in first class. And she said to me, you'd think that he would greet the other customers the same way we do, thanking them for their business and thanking them for their loyalty. She said, no, all he did is he sat down, he pulled out his laptop, he didn't talk to anyone, he didn't talk to me, he didn't, I'd come by, he wouldn't even say thank you, wouldn't look at me at the eye, and he got off the plane, never said thank you, and they wonder why this industry is going down the toilet. So in this case, we have no idea what that executive story was. We have no idea if he had a deadline, if he had a sick parent. We have no idea. But we know is his lack of behavior, his lack of interaction sent a very clear message. So again, it goes back to that you're always being watched, both for what you do as well as for what you don't do. Yeah, I remember um, years ago working in an organization um, where I was head of HR for division and... Um, when the HR director wasn't there, I would be deputised for all the other divisions. Sure. And um, I remember going, I was in the head office and walking to see the HR director. And it was one of those offices where everyone had like a glass cubicle. All the directors mm-hmm. had a glass cubicle. And I remember just walking past. And I saw one of the directors and he looked terrible. Like mm-hmm. the world has, you know, has ended in terrible and his cubicle was right next to the HR director's cubicle so when I went into that the HR director's cubicle I said what's wrong with him and they said what do you mean because like generally normally it was a really bubbly happy-go-lucky kind of person and he looked like somebody had died it looked really bad and um, and they said what do you mean and I said obviously something's happened what's going on I don't know and I said you not notice no and just go, oh. and I was like really surprised. Anyway, so I walked past and, and nothing had changed. A bit later on in the day, he's still looking the same way. I know it's like seriously, and then I asked again, "Have you had a chance to go and talk to him to find because this is her peer? Yeah. You know, it's actually her peer. So he's a he wasn't even like." And she said, "No, no, I'm too busy." Anyway, so I stopped in and said, "Have you got a minute?" She's like, "Yes, come in, shut the door. What's going?" And I literally was like, "What's going on?" What's the matter with it? Clearly something's happening. What can I do to help you? So we had a long conversation. Turned out it had a, um, he was worried he was going to be sacked because he had this, he'd made this humongous mistake and the MD was not happy. Um, but I, then I helped him kind of come up with a solution to how to fix that problem. And how, and I said, this is what I've observed when you're you know, talking to this guy, you're winding him up because you're doing this. And like, you know, so we had an action plan. And, and by the end of the day, it was all fixed and all sorted. And I remember going back to, you know, where my people were and thinking, why am I doing that? You know, mm. this is this should be something that she should do right. because she's his peer and also that her role, but all you know, the role should be doing it, but also she's his peer and she sits literally next to him, but she was too yeah. busy to do that. 
And I, and I you know, it really surprised me when, you oh. know, because that's not leadership. You should be aware of every what everybody's temperature is in the organization that you're impacting on. Yeah, yeah. You know, as you say that, Jude, it, it reminds me of, I remember having a mentor who taught me a long time ago saying that, you know, there are those times we all feel like, hey, someone should do something about this. Someone needs to and realize that, you know what leadership is? It's when you feel that little thumb poking you between your two, the, the back of your back, pushing you forward. Because who's that someone? That someone's me, right? I need to step up. And yeah, it'd be great if someone else swooped in, but that's not what leadership is. So I've taken that to mean that what leaders have to get good at is we have to learn how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Is when you feel that uncomfortable little invisible thumb pushing you in the back that you go, oh, that's a sign. It's time to step up. Yeah, just before we close, that reminded me so much in my early, my first HR manager role. And I was, I don't know, 24 or something like that. And I remember coming in, it was a retail organization coming in in the in the morning at I don't know eight or half seven something like that and walking down and hearing a whole load of noise and yelling and shouting and you know as you get closer because you're a senior manager you're starting to dread you know what is it <laughs> you know I really don't want to do this in the morning and what it was it was a night shift manager literally having a go and then a shouting with a day shift manager so they were swapping shifts and obviously something had happened and they were trying to avoid blame but they were yelling and shouting and it looked like they were going to have a fisty cut fight. And I remember walking, and all the staff were just like, well, this is interesting. We'll just stand and watch to see what's going on. I remember walking past them and uh, getting probably main ground and I three or four feet past them and then stopping and going, I'm the one that has to stop this. <laughs> like, yeah. And I remember actually standing between them and saying, right, you, over there, you, my office. And, it's, you know, and I was like looking up to this six foot tall guy. So I was like, but having to like really being scared on the inside, but kind of portraying like I'm in total control. I know exactly what's going on. I can sort this right. out. It was probably always one of the most scariest times, but it just goes to show that if you, if you portray yourself as a leader, then people will respect that because it didn't, because yeah. they didn't argue with me. They literally just went in their separate corners. One went to the office, one, one went there and they just allowed me to resolve and sort the situation out. Um, mm -hmm which is what I wasn't expecting, bearing in mind my age, their age, and right. what I'd seen. But I knew that as a leader, especially in HR, if I'd walked past that, how could I then sit down and say, this is what we expect for the organisation, when, what, 30 members of staff saw me just ignore it? Right, right, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Which, to be honest, I kind of wanted to do because I was a little bit scared. <laughs> yeah. Which is cool. So... Um, it's probably a good place to end, but before I do that, is there anything that you would have wanted me to ask you? Oh, what a fabulous question. Um, no, I mean, we've, you know, I guess, no, more did I say, like, to quick to summarize, the fact is leadership is a journey. It's not oh. an event. And I'd say, you know, there are a lot of places, a lot of ways in. So it doesn't have to start with connection or communication or collaboration, but it has to start with some one of those probably. And what I always suggest to people is pick something, get started and take action. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of great stuff around the science of habit formation is that you want to cultivate the habit of becoming a better leader. If you want to be a better leader, you need to do what great leaders do. And not just once, but consistently over time. You won't see the dividends pay off necessarily today or tomorrow, but you will in a few weeks and a few months and certainly yeah. in a few years. And so if I could leave you with anything, it's just that recognizing that it is a journey. Mm, brilliant. Thank you so much. If um, we find another topic, would you come back again? Oh, I'd be happy to. We could talk about lots of great stuff. I'd be happy to. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Alan as much as I enjoyed having it. If you are pathologically curious and would love to find out more about the Maverick Paradox, then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders.
For those that love a good discussion, you could apply to join our exclusive Facebook group. And finally, if you'd like to work with us or just interested in finding out more about the Maverick at work, check out our website, maverickparadox.co.uk. Thank you.